Welcome to the Unitarian Universalist Congregation of Danbury. Please silence your phones if you have not. My name is Dave Lias. It's kind of like Elias without the E. Not a common name. I signed the book just last spring, so I'm really still a newbie. But I do uh, am busy. I've greeted three times, been a greeter. Uh, attend the men's group on occasion. Um, I attend the yoga, chair yoga, led by Joe Gelati, which is good for me. And I'm a, kind of an adjunct member of the uh, uh, caring circle, which I really enjoy. Uh, and have made a couple of calls in that, from that group. And just recently, I joined the auction committee. Um, I'm not sure what I'm going to be doing, but I <laughs> will do all that I can. <laughs> um, I have three daughters. And the old saying is that if you have a daughter, you have a friend for life. And I absolutely believe that. And also three grandchildren. And the unusual part about that is I have a grandson who's 29, and I also have a grandson who's three. <laughs> our, our family was spread out. The Unitarian Universalist Congregation of Danbury has been gathering for over 200 years. As we work to build more just a, a more just world, we respectfully acknowledge that our physical plant building is on the traditional land of the Pawsucket, Sucket, Paul, Gusset people. I am so glad that you are able to join us today. I think many of us folks are on Zoom this morning, I think. You are an essential part of our celebration. Whether today is your first or your thousandth Sunday, in our midst, in person or online, we are stronger because you are with us. If you are new to our community 
and joining on us online, we invite you to introduce yourself and where you are connecting from on the chat box as when you're comfortable with that. To participate uh, in the breakout um, group for the individual connections, they have deeper check-ins. If you are new here in person, please fill out the card and the entrance. We are one people of many beliefs, many origins, sexualities, and genders. I lost my place. <laughs> we are all growing, all learning, all loved, just as you are. You are welcome here. There are a couple of announcements. Maybe. The first one is today we welcome Stephen Lee Williams as our guest speaker. Stephen is a guest candidate for ministry. He holds a Master of Arts in Social Justice and a Master of, in Art, of Arts in Ministry and Culture from Phillips Theological Seminary. Stephen currently serves as pastoral care associate with the Church of the Large Fellowship. They are proud members of TRIST and a youth chaplain of Uplift, the UA, UUA's monthly online gathering for trans and non-binary people. Stephen has a passion for youth ministry and has served at local, regional, and national levels. He lives in Broken Arrow, Oklahoma. That's a story in itself, I understand. Um, a suburb of uh, his hometown, Tulsa, with his spouse, Karen, two adult stepkids, and their menagerie. That wasn't described, how many, <laughs> what it is. Stephen loves being in nature, discussing theology, and putting googly eyes on the unexpected places. We have an additional announcement. The auction committee has begun their labors, and we ask you to save the date of February 11th for the um, centennial auction. We have already raised $1,000 with our pre-auction holiday sale. Thanks to all of those, all of those who, who contributed their goods and services and those who purchased them, that makes it work. There were cookies, lasagna, rides to the airport, and many, many catnip mouse toys. I got one of those. To name a few uh, that were sold, think about what you would like to offer for the full auction on February 11th. You can find Barb Myers, Diane Purvis, or Lisa Horton and let them know. Or you can send an email to auction at uudanbury.org after stewardship. This is our biggest fundraiser.
we're just going to take a moment to greet one another, and especially um, if there are folks that you don't know well or haven't met, take a moment and say hello to each other. And if you are online, glad you're here. And please join us in our hymn of welcome 360. The words will be on the screen. If you want to follow along musically and don't have one of these there in the back, I apologize for not sending them. lighting affirmation. I'm going to use my school teacher voice. Oh, but the people online. Oh, that's true. Okay. Um, Can you tell me if the online mic is working, Barb? Yes. 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 Okay. Join me in the words of our challenge lighting affirmation. Love is the spirit of this congregation, and justice is its light. This is our covenant, to dwell together in peace, to see and speak the truth in love, to help one another and celebrate life. So this is working online. Can you all hear me in this room, or should I use that mic? No, you can hear me. Great. I'm going to move this a little closer to the chancel table so I can use my class. Oh, I'm not being able to be heard by everybody, so I'm going to move. OK. Um, let's say together the words for our children's affirmation, which are on the screen. We are Unitarian Universalists. We are people with open minds, loving hearts, and helping hands. 
We care for the earth and each other. It is so good to be together. Now, I'm having a thought about how I should best access my props. Hold on a second. Given that I've moved mics, I need to do a little rearrangement. Hold on. That is some carrot. Once upon a time, three friends had been traveling for many days through a wooded forest without having passed a village. With tents and no beds to sleep in, their backs ached and they longed for a good night's rest. And although they were familiar with edible forest plants and had eaten snacks gifted by the forest along their journey, their tummies rumbled and they began to long for a good filling meal. Fortunately for them, just as their tummies turned from rumbles to hunger pains, they saw some smoke in the distance and soon realized that they had finally come upon another village. Now I'll pause for a second. Anybody recognize this story? We've got an ancient story here. As they made their way toward the smoking chimneys, they felt relief deep down in their bones. They looked forward to good conversations with strangers who would become friends lodging with beds, and they imagined a hearty meal or two to help them along on the next part of their journey. Unfortunately, the town they were entering had been through some very tough times. There were no inns to stay in and no places for travelers to find a meal. In fact, each person had begun to think mostly of themselves. When they came and went from their homes to fetch water or get something from their gardens or even do business, they hardly lifted their heads to greet one another. They no longer remembered each other's names. They most certainly didn't know one another's children's names or the stories of their families. Everything learned was private knowledge and each idea benefited only the person who had it. When someone was sick, they did their best to make some tea and nurse themselves back to health. But no one dropped in to help out or left a gift on the doorstep. When a person needed to mend a roof or fix a door, they did it for themselves or hired someone to do it and knew that it was strictly business. Each family ate only what they could grow in their gardens. If a fungus destroyed their tomato plants, they had no tomatoes. It was possible to go through an entire winter with just a small sack of potatoes and a few onions. Tummies rumbled, not because there was not enough food in the village, but because hardly anything was ever shared without it being business. Every abundance was a private abundance belonging to the one single family that owned it. And every scarcity or sorrow was also a private scarcity or sorrow held by the family that experienced it. So who do you think greeted the strangers at the village gate? Shaking head, a shaking head, that's right. No one came to greet the friends as they entered the village gate. They could hear a few children playing behind fences and stone walls, but they saw no one. Somebody is not muted online, just so you know. <laughs> check, check. When they knocked on a door at a house with a smoking chimney, there was no answer. So the friends made their way to an empty courtyard and entering the courtyard, they had a moment of hope. Hmm. 
as alone as each family in the town seemed to be caring only for themselves, they had somehow maintained a beautiful courtyard, each planting flowers as they passed through, pulling weeds or sweeping the stones upon which they traveled for their own pleasure. The friends decided that a community that could work together without realizing that they were in it together might still come to realize that they were indeed in it together and every corner of the town could hold the beauty of community just as the courtyard did. So what did they do? Anybody recognize this story? I see some nods, okay, this is getting familiar. So with great fanfare and a lot of commotion as they found a pot in their bag, and started a fire. They sung and talked and laughed and their laughter brought out a child who came to see what strangers might be doing in the courtyard with such unfamiliar boisterousness. This might be our best stone soup yet, cried out one friend as he looked around for some nice smooth stones. I'll fetch the water, shouted another one of the friends, scurrying off. Oh, but it's too bad that this pot is so small, said the third friend, since usually a uh, stone soup calls for a bigger pot. The child who'd been watching shyly from behind a tree had never heard of stone soup and wondered how it was made. She thought that learning how to make soup from stones could help her rumbling tummy. So she ran home to find a bigger pot to offer to the three friends who were to her just strangers. She figured she could learn by watching. So in her kitchen, she told her parents that she was gonna learn how to make soup from stones and all she needed was a large pot. The pot was a prized pot from the more abundant times and her parents agreed whether she would take care of it as she was playing whatever game she was playing. So as she left the house, her parents came hurrying after. This caught the attention of some more children who followed to see what was happening. When they reached the courtyard, the child gave the large pot to the friends who were strangers to her offering it in exchange for allowing her to watch how the soup was made. Sure, said one of the friends, putting a few stones in the bottom of the pot, but it's really too bad we have no salt and pepper because it's always a better soup with salt and pepper. Oops, I forgot my salt and pepper shaker down there. Thank you, thank you, Randy. One of the children who followed to see what was happening and also wanted to see how they could make soup from stone shouted, oh, I have some salt and pepper, I'll be right back. And I'm sure that you can imagine that their parents were a little stunned to see their child running out of the house with salt and pepper. And they scooted after their child to get it back. <clears throat> after all, many families in the village were worried that they didn't have enough. When they arrived, the parents saw the child stick some salt and pepper into the large pot that was boiling on the fire in the courtyard, and they weren't alone. There was a bigger crowd gathering, this time because another child had gone back home and come back, come back with some carrots, which the three friends said would make the soup sweeter, and another child to get an onion because the three friends said no soup is ever really complete without some onions. And still another child was just returning with some celery because of course a soup needs celery too. Each child seemed to come back with an adult or a few hurrying behind them trying to catch up. But when they arrived in the courtyard, everyone became still with shock. Who were these strangers and why were they taking all this food for themselves? The stillness was broken when a parent shouted at her child, Oh no, you don't! Just as her child was about to put tomatoes in the pot. 
I'm so sorry, said one of the three friends who were still strangers to the people of the village. The children have never seen soup made from stones and thought they might want to learn because of their rumbling tummies. But there's plenty of soup here to go around and we would be happy to share. Ah, some potatoes really could make for a more filling soup for a crowd this large, though, added another one of the three friends. And I think that's why we wanted the tomatoes, too, isn't it? Said the third. And a little hesitantly, the tomatoes were added. And someone went off to get potatoes. The soup was starting to smell very good. And since it was being cooked in the open, the last of the villagers still in their homes couldn't help sm but smell it and notice the smoke coming from the courtyard. Curiosity getting the best of them, they too headed out to find oh what God. was happening. To find out bananas. what was happening. Look, sounds on mute. Go ahead and mute. <laughs> And soon the whole village was there. Foods of all kinds were being added to the pot. And the sun was setting so beautifully over the, fla over the flowers of the courtyard that the villagers couldn't help but turn to one another and comment on it. After a while, they began to introduce themselves. Some even struck up a conversation, waiting for the most delicious soup and all felt the sweetness of community in that courtyard. It was so beautiful that one family was moved to head home and get instruments to play. Pretty soon the whole village was singing in the fresh darkness of the night. Where it would normally be cold, the community offered warmth and no one felt that they were on their own around that fire. Somehow bowls and spoons started to show up and eventually when the potatoes and the turnips were softened just enough, the three friends who once were strangers to the villagers but were no longer spooned heaping helpings of soup into each bowl. Miraculously, there was more than enough. Never had anyone tasted something more delicious than that soup a hushed reverence, a feeling of awe and respect fell over the community as they ate. Each person cared for, each person once again connected and more prepared to make their village beautiful and full of goodness in every corner. The villagers stayed warm around that fire late into the night and helped one another home laughing and joyous. And we can be sure that the three friends who were no longer strangers in this village had a cozy place to sleep that night as they rested for the journey ahead. All right, any kids in the room, I want to invite you to come with me downstairs for programs this morning, and we will sing This Little Light of Mine as we go. Joys that uh, are uplifting anyone and the sorrows that are weighing anyone down. And together, let us take a deep breath and let it out. And continue to breathe into the silence.
May we be one in the silence and the prayers of our hearts. Blessed be. And please join us in singing hymn number 318, We Would Be One. Our reading today comes from a book titled From All That Is Our Live by Skinner House, and this is by the Reverend Douglas Taylor, titled The Blessings of Community. Alone in the world, I was beset with frustration and anger at the world around me. So much injustice and hatred, so little peace and freedom. I longed to make a difference I struggled against powers and institutions, but my actions seemed insignificant and my words were drowned out. Then I came into community, a religious community of hope and love. And here I found support and energy, vision and power, the authority of shared witness. And together we changed the world. Alone in the world, I was beset with sorrow and hurt in my life. So much loss and emptiness, so little hope and understanding. I wept for the pain in my heart. I ached from the hardships I bore, but my tears brought little relief and my burdens grew too heavy. Then I came into community a religious community of hope and love. Here I found support and compassion, wisdom and grace, and the power of shared suffering. And together we made life sweeter. <laughs> Alone in the world, I was beset by confusion and emptiness in my soul. So much busyness and pettiness, so little depth or connection. I shriveled inside from want of real spiritual bonds and my soul cried out for meaning. Then I came into community, a religious community of hope and love. Here I found support and encouragement, depth and diversity, and the power of sharing the journey. And together, we saved my life. For all the varied reasons, 
that have brought us out of loneliness and into community, we give thanks for the blessings we bestow on one another with our energy, compassion, and prayer, we give thanks. For the blessings to, we become to others in need, we give thanks and remember that we are not alone. It is now time for our congregational offering. Um, if you are here in the room, um, we hope that you will share your generosity, express your generosity and support for this community we love as um, the baskets are coming around. If you are at home, you can um, click the QR code on your screen or simply mail a check if you're of the old school, as many of us are, to 24 Clapper Ridge Road in Danbury. Thank you for sharing your generosity with this congregation that we love. Now we have the pleasure of hearing Janet's cello and Carl's piano. Thank mm -hmm. you. 
morning once again, and it's good to be with you. So, church, let's get to the chase. What's the point of church? The question on a uh, question I've posed to you, question on all your minds, since you know it's printed in your order of service and everything. Why do we come here? Why do we give our time, talent, and treasure to this place and other places like it? Some might say the point of church is to come to know God or the divine. Others might say it is to shore ourselves up each week before going back out into the world. Some say church is not all that important. It's a social activity at best, something to do on Sunday mornings. So others might say that church is not just unimportant, but pointless. That it is a relic of times gone by, a dying institution, something we'd be better off abandoning so we can divert those resources elsewhere. Statistically, I can't say those last group is that far off base. Progressive churches, not just you, you are losing members, pledges, buildings, and influence, and have been on this trajectory since the 1970s. Pandemic times have accelerated what was already inevitable for many. Now it seems like just about every other week I'm hearing about congregation that is having excruciating conversations about how and whether to stay open. Cut a minister's hours, lay off staff, repair or share or sell their building. These are hard, heartbreaking conversations. No one wants to have them. But they too are part of the work of church, of being in community. A poignant but depressing observation, Stephen, you may be thinking. But it doesn't really answer the question of what's the point. And why are you asking these questions anyway? Aren't you preaching to the choir somewhat literally by setting up a sermon on the virtues of church to the people who show up to service? Because, of course, this hour isn't all church is. Relatedly, I should acknowledge that a minister asking, does church matter, is a bit like a government official asking, so how about our awesome state? I'm not exactly unbiased, but I have considered these questions seriously over the last nine years since I started seminary and officially embarked on this calling path. I have doubted the answers. I have even nearly washed my hands of church a couple of times when the going was really rough. The obstacles seemed insurmountable and the institutionalized oppression was coming from inside the house. But I couldn't. Church mattered too much. And not just for a paycheck. Church mattered too much to me and to the world. And what I was called to do in cooperation with the church mattered more than my pride and my ego, no matter how hurt they were. Now, I'm speaking as one called to the ministry, but this could go for anyone. I feel strongly that our that, that church is important, that our UU church is important, that the covenantal communities we create and the theology we embody the oneness from our Unitarian side and worthiness from our Universalist side are salvific. That means they save lives. Within that, we are all called to be of service in and with our church. This is true now more than ever as fundamentalism strikes a new power chord in the larger society and political realm. <laughs> Our values and beliefs matter. They may be the difference between life and death for people who are marginalized by the Christian rights doctrine. 
which is shaping policies, attitudes, and acts of violence across the country in ways that violate the inherent worth and dignity of every person and cut people off from the interconnected web of existence of which we are all a part. What happens when the people who claim a country's religious authority insist that those among us who live and love differently from them are not just wrong, but criminally bad. Over 300, 300 anti-LGBT bills introduced at state and federal levels this year. Mostly anti-trans, mostly aimed at school children. Teachers fired for who they are and whom they protect. Parents jailed for trying to keep their children alive and well. Suicide rates and attempts skyrocketing among target populations. Senator Cruz's daughter, one among these. Nightclubs shut up. Queer friendly businesses firebombed. The list goes on. Like I said, this is life and death, this matter of our values and beliefs. We have religious and moral authority too. What we believe and value matters. We offer another way for people who've been told that who they are is a sin. Give them not hell, but hope and courage, wrote Arthur S. Cole in a story about Universalist Reverend John Murray. That is what we do when we preach and practice interconnectedness and worthiness. That is what our theology of love unconditional provides people who are living through hell on earth, hope and courage, two life-saving elements for those among us who are in peril from the violence of the theology of judgment and damnation made manifest in hateful legislation, mass murders, and preventable mental health crises. Unitarian Universalism, at its best, saves lives. Queer lives, trans lives, black and brown lives, disabled lives, immigrant lives, poor and working class lives. I've seen it, I've lived it. It's the reason I became a minister. So story time. The moment I said yes to my calling path was about two years before I started seminary. And about 16 years after the first time I said, and eh, not yet because I was 12 and I saw no models of youth led ministry at that time. Fortunately, that is changing a bit. The more recent not yet's were fear based. I just wasn't ready. I thought I was young. I had made so many mistakes. I had so much to learn and not yet. But the summer I was 28, I had just finished the long and winding road to my undergraduate diploma in New Orleans. And on my way up to Tulsa to visit family, I stopped in at Swoosey, our regional UU summer camp, now called amusingly The Point, which is what I'm trying to make for you. The name of the sunset talk that evening was How UU Saved My Life. The speaker, the now departed Reverend Beth Ellen Cooper told the story of how that had happened for her. First as a young student in the Pacific Northwest, several times over up to and including her first year of ordained ministry. Visions of my own life flashed before my eyes, which were wet tears. Though our stories were very different, you, you had saved my life too. First, as a teenager, queer and trans and scared 
and coming of age in the Bible Belt in the 1990s when my church, All Souls, was my sanctuary. And the wider network of youth events gave me spaces to be myself, to play and worship among friends. The gift of a spirit of life and love that included me had been nothing short of salvific in the face of proselytizing threats at school and in the world. Yu Yu has saved my life several times since then, each of which could be its own sermon and none of which would get us any closer to the point today. But church, when I heard Reverend Beth Ellen tell that about the moment that she learned that her job as a minister was, quote, to get out of the way and let love in. I tell you all that fear and doubt around my heart broke open because hallelujah, it wasn't about me. It was about love. And if love had been the force that saved me, then couldn't I be a channel for love? And I said, yes, that is my job too, to be a minister of love. And the universe heard my yes and took me along for a ride that continues today, 11 years later as I prepare to see the UUA Ministerial Fellowship Committee in March. Throughout that time, this theology of interconnectedness and original blessing has kept me afloat and saved me over and over again from desperate places in my life. Even when people within the church and the institutions that support it have broken my heart, which they do, and they will, because the fact is, the church is made up of humans, and we are all fallible, and that is not the church's fault. And the institutions we build are rife with our own failings, hubris, and generational trauma, and we are in the process of figuring out how to dismantle the dangerous parts without tearing down the whole building. That is the work of our UUA Article 2 Commission, which is revising our statement of principles and purposes for the first time since the 1980s. This is hard and holy work. Hard for many of us, like myself, because the seven principles and six sources are the only UUism we've ever known. Hard for we who also, like myself, want to see our faith expand into what it needs to be in this century and decade and the ones to come and see the sense and change and letting go so that more people can come in. Holy because the process of unraveling and weaving a many layered history laden spiritual covenantal document like the UUA bylaws is an honor and a labor of love. One we all get to partake in with volunteers on the commission who are getting a lot of pushback for leading the work the voting body of our faith tasks them with. This is the work of Stone Soup. Everyone bringing what they have to the to the pot, so the soup will become more than enough for everyone. These places, the tender ones, where we break each other's hearts, or are broken open by the necessity of change, are where covenant continues to save me and us, to hold us and heal us. Even when wounds run deep or repairs take a while, our covenants within and among congregations, the agreements we make about how to be, how we are to be together, are the interconnected web, the ties of love which bind us together, giving dignity, meaning, worth, and joy to all of our days. To borrow words from the invocation of my childhood church, covenant holds what we and our individual fallibility cannot. It keeps the circle whole. Even if individual threads are strained or broken, 
and thus always preserves the possibility of repair. And that is a key point of church, connectedness and community. Most of us don't get it at this level anywhere else, not in our workplaces, no matter how much time we spend there or how much they push a corporate family culture. Not at school, where a culture of authority and discipline remains the standard, even in many higher education spaces. Some of us can get it in our families, not all. Even if we have a great family or friend group, a grounding in explicit shared spiritual values and practice anchors and deepens our relationships. Church makes the family bigger. Unitarian theologian James Luther Adams speaks to this and many pertinent ideas in his 1946 essay, A Faith for the Free. The roots of faith grow in the individual as one participates in the worshiping, educating, and socially active fellowship of the church. And certainly, if they do not grow in the individual, they will not grow in the family. And if they do not grow in the family, they will not grow in the community. And if they do not grow in the community, they will not grow in the world. What I get from that and the rest of his essay is that these beliefs and values that we want to foster in the world won't happen if we don't follow, if we don't lead into the point of our church, lean into the point of our church, which is to create a community that fills human needs for connection, reverence, care, and transformation. Church at its best allows us to transcend our individualism and limited ideas, to be of service and receive blessings from something bigger than ourselves, to make stone soup that nourishes more than we can imagine, to create and partake in the blessings of community. As I was preparing this sermon, I was reminded of one that I heard from Reverend Aaron White of First UU Dallas several years ago. It's the future of UUism from September 2012, if you go wandering off to look for it on YouTube. He says he's noticed that Unitarian Universalists have trouble talking about our church with others because we disproportionately carry religious baggage. And we've let our baggage about organized religion lead us to believe that proselytizing or trying to convert people is the same thing as simply talking about the church, even if someone asks. But if we don't talk about it, how will anyone know we're here? hard as it may be to talk about these vulnerable parts of ourselves, our lives, and what gives them meaning, White says, it's not just about adding people to our membership roles. This is about human beings. If you believe this is a wonderful place to be and it has benefited your life and benefits the world, then every single human being who would benefit from it deserves to know about. White himself would never have known about our faith tradition without being invited, and he was a religion major in college. It would be very stingy of me, he said, to be like, this place is great, changed my life, and I'm never going to tell another soul about it. <laughs> Especially, I would add, if it might save their life or someone else's. Regardless, of where your congregation falls and the stats of shrinking versus stability. And as a guest, I have no way of knowing. The more people who know you're here, the better your church can live into it. And so my challenge for you this week is to talk to somebody, not a you, you about your church. And if the opportunity arises, tell them something real about what this place means to you. You don't have to try to convert them or bring them with you next Sunday, although it would be kind of rude not to invite them if they seem interested. Might it be awkward? Probably. It's okay. Being human is super awkward. 
he has is making authentic connections. Hey, I even feel awkward telling people in the wider world that I'm a minister again. But if the only ministers and churchgoers they hear talking about their religion and spirituality are the ones trying to convert them and telling them they're hellbound sinners, they'll never know there's a place that they can be loved and valued just as they are on their journey to connect with a greater reality. The point of church, this kind of church anyway, is to meet our human needs for connection, reverence, and care and community that changes us to change our world. And in doing so, we create a microcosm of the world we wish to live in and live into it in the world around us, saving lives in the process, including our own. May we all be ministers of love, capital L, radical, love unconditional, that brings hope and courage in even the most acute earthly suffering. May it be so. Please join me in the words for extinguishing our chalice. I will say them and then extinguish the chalice so that everyone can hear. We extinguish this flame, but not the light of truth, the warmth of community, or the fire of commitment. These we carry in our hearts and out into the world until we are together again. Join us in our hymn of celebration, 128, for all that is our <coughs> is all of our lives. Sing thanks and praise, go out into the world and be ministers of love unconditional and have those awkward conversations. Who knows what lives may be saved in the spirit of life and love. 
go and be blessed and be a blessing. Amen. Amen. Thank you.